Hello, this is Ron Broussard, and today we're going to talk about Chapter 20, Acute Diabetic Emergencies. Now, diabetes can cause changes in mental status related to alterations in blood glucose levels. Acute diabetic emergencies are life-threatening, prompt recognition and care are critical, and diabetes has serious long-term complications. Now, the big thing to understand with diabetes is this disease affects our body's ability to metabolize carbohydrates. Okay. Specifically, we have an issue uh, pulling sugar into the cells, leading to very high blood glucose levels. So we need to take medications to then lower those sugar levels. Now, those medications can lower our sugar levels too much, which creates the life-threatening emergency and why time is so critical for us. Some of the long-term complications that we're worried about are going to be things like heart disease, okay? damage to microcirculation that leads to increased infections and poor wound healing and also blindness. Diabetes is actually the leading cause of blindness. Now, understanding diabetes. Uh, in a normal person, okay, under normal circumstances, we have hormones that regulate blood glucose levels, okay? Insulin will help lower blood glucose levels by allowing the cell to take it in, and glucagon is another hormone that will increase blood glucose levels uh, by breaking down glycogen, which is a stored form of glucose, primarily stored in the liver, uh, to make usable glucose, and also uh, increase gluconeogenesis, which is the breakdown of uh, other items, such as fat, uh, to create a usable source of energy. Now, with diabetic emergencies, uh, we have that abnormality, so we're not able to pull glucose into the cell, so we need to take medications that control the sugar levels, but sometimes it can lower it too much, leading to you know, life-threatening conditions and altered mental status. Now, glucose. Glucose in itself is a simple sugar. It is a simple carbohydrate, all right, and can be easily uh, absorbed into the, into the cell uh, to be used through the process called glycolysis, okay? Now, we have com complex carbohydrates which require your body to break them down further, okay? That's why with like a, a diabetic emergency, uh, such as, you know, hypoglycemia, uh, we don't want to just give them a spoonful of table sugar because table sugar is, you know, it's a disaccharide. Uh, so your body actually has to break that down into a simple sugar. I think it's like uh, glucose and sucrose or one of those things. Uh, but your body has to break it down into a simpler form uh, to, to adequately absorb it. Now, regulation of blood glucose levels are, are critical to normal cell function. All right, uh, with that, brain cells can only use glucose as an energy form. So the brain can't use fat, for example, uh, as a source of energy. Now, the body in time can uh, break down fats into a usable source of energy from the brain, but that takes time and it's not beneficial uh, in acute hypoglycemic emergencies. Now, low blood glucose glucose levels result in altered mental status, and that's a very early sign of hypoglycemia. One of the first thing we, things that we see affected is going to be the brain from low blood sugar levels. Now, prolonged low blood glucose levels lead to brain cell death. If you remember back to pathophysiology and cell metabolism, you know, we have oxygen and we talk about glucose. Now, oxygen is that catalyst that increases that chemical reaction, but glucose is that fuel source. Okay, it is the primary fuel source. And imagine driving your car without gas. It's not going to go anywhere, all right? Just like your body without any glucose in it. You know, your brain's not going to function right, uh, and it can lead to brain cell death. Now, Excessive glucose in the cells causes water to enter into the cell, okay, which will cause the cell to swell. This will worsen things like head injury or strokes. So it's very important when we have those patients, like any stroke patient that we get in the hospital, we're checking blood sugars on to rule out hypoglycemia as a cause of, say, their altered mental status. Also, because if they're having a stroke, we don't want to risk giving them sugar because it could make that stroke worse. Now, high blood glucose levels, glucose then gets excreted by uh, the kidneys through the urine. Now, 
the issue there, because glucose is such a large molecule, uh, as we let out glucose uh, through the urine, it's going to pull a large amount of fluid with it, and that's going to lead to dehydration. Now, hormones that regulate blood glucose levels. Insulin is going to be the first one we're talking about. So insulin uh, is secreted by the pancreas okay when blood glucose levels get high now normal function like you eat lunch you eat a snickers bar whatever it might be all right your sugar levels are going to go up in response to that your pancreas is going to secrete insulin uh insulin is like the key to the cell that opens the door for glucose to go through okay so when insulin then gets secreted by the pancreas it touches on those insulin receptors, opens the door, and allows glucose uh, to go through that glycolysis process. Uh, and then the cell can use it as its energy source. All right. Now, without insulin, we don't have adequate levels of glucose entering into the cell. Glucose remains in the bloodstream, and that gives us high blood glucose levels. Now, the thing is, is as blood glucose levels get high, the brain is getting what it needs because the brain actually doesn't need insulin to use the glucose. So mental status for high sugar levels are going to be fine, but the body is going to be starving for glucose for that energy source. And it's going to be sending messages to the patient. It's like, hey, eat something, eat something. We need more energy when in fact it just can't pull in the energy that's already in the body to begin with. All right, so insulin is that key that helps lower blood glucose levels by allowing it to enter into the cell. All right, so here's a nice little graphic that shows you this. So you have an insulin receptor here. Insulin then can attach to that insulin receptor, opens this channel for glucose to enter through to go through cellular metabolism. Now, without insulin, glucose cannot effectively enter into the cell, and the body needs to break down sources for energy such as fat now while some people might think hey that's not a bad thing you know we need to burn some fat uh, there are byproducts that get created here such as ketones now uh, like the keto diet is is big and, and it's you know an effective diet for for some people uh, but the thing is is that with ketosis and like this dieting state versus uh, this the ketones that get produced it's at an ex a lot higher level than and you know somebody who's dieting than it is somebody who has you know type 1 diabetes and is breaking down fats uh, and there is a high risk you know for high ketone levels and then uh, increased acidity of the blood now other hormones that regulate blood sugar levels are glucagon. Now, glucagon is also secreted by the pancreas, okay, and this gets secreted when blood glucose levels get low, okay. So, if you've ever had, uh, you know, that sugar crash after you've had like a sugary drink, you know, you feel really energetic, your sugar levels were getting high body picked up on that insulin was secreted which lowered your sugar levels and now all of a sudden you're really lethargic and you're tired and you don't have that much energy but you know you're able to power through and then eventually your body gets back up towards that baseline that you've been at uh well when that sugar level got low your body picked up on this and your pancreas secreted glucagon in response now, when that glucagon got secreted, that triggered your body to, you know, break down glycogen in the liver, which will help increase blood glucose levels in your circulating blood. So it breaks down glycogen, uh, and then that broken down glycogen enters into the blood and increases blood glucose levels, bringing you to that normal level of function. Now, epinephrine. Epinephrine gets secreted when blood glucose levels get very low, okay, and that is secreted by the adrenal glands. Now, what epinephrine does is it actually inhibits insulin secretion and promotes release of stored glucose from the liver. So that stored glucose, remember guys, is called glycogen, okay, so it will promote the release of that stored form of glucose by the liver. Now, epinephrine is responsible for some of the signs and symptoms that we see in hypoglycemia 
such as cool, pale, clammy skin, tachycardia, kind of the tremors are shaking by the patient. Okay, a lot of those are there because of the epinephrine release. Now, normal metabolism and blood glucose regulation. So the normal range for blood glucose levels are between 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Now, insulin is secreted in response to increased blood glucose levels. So when your blood glucose levels get high, insulin is secreted to lower blood glucose levels. Now, between meals, when your sugar levels drop because your body's doing stuff, it's active, it's using that energy, glucagon can get secreted to increase blood glucose levels, taking it from the liver, that glycogen, converting it into usable glucose, all right, to increase your blood glucose levels to maintain and keep you going. Now, testing blood glucose levels are done with the glucometer. So just remember, your normal levels are going to be between 70 to 140, okay? And then we interpret the reading, determine the last time the patient has eaten or drank anything. So with that, we just want to see, it's like, all right, has my patient had a large meal that is, you know, full of, you know, carbohydrates and they had, you know, soda with that versus have they been fasting? Okay, typically a fasting glucose level, we're expecting to see less than 100, all right? But if the patient hasn't eaten in 12 hours and their sugar levels are 350, all right, that, you know, that's a concern there. All right, so those are things that we'll find out, and those are questions that you're going to want to ask. Now, hypoglycemia uh, is when the blood glucose level is 70 milligrams per deciliter or less with signs and symptoms, okay? So that altered mental status, confusion, they've slurred speech, they're cool, pale, clammy, they're tachycardic, all right? And they have that blood glucose level of less than 70. High Hyperglycemia is going to be when the blood glucose level is 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher. All right, so that's going to kind of be our, our, our lines there. Now, for testing the blood glucose level with the glucometer, you're going to need some things. Ultimately, you're going to need your glucometer. You're going to need your test strips. You're going to need a lancet. All right, that's for actually poking the patient to create the blood. All right, you're gonna need an alcohol swab, a Band-Aid, and a piece of gauze. All right, you're gonna gather all of your equipment, uh, turn on your glucometer, insert the little testing strip into the glucometer on the screen, it'll show you a little blood drop, and that's letting you know it's ready for a sample. At that point, you can clean the site. Okay, so clean off whatever patient's finger. We always prefer to go, you know, to the side of the finger versus directly on the, the middle of the pad. All right, understand that these patients, if they've been checking their blood glucose levels a lot, their fingers may be calloused and it may be difficult for you to get blood from there. Uh, but you're going to clean it off, allow it to dry, and then you're going to use your lancet to get your blood. All right. Now, after you've used that, after you performed your finger you may need to milk the finger a little bit. So what I mean by milk the finger is you're simply going to compress the finger and actually work distally down the finger to produce milk out of that small puncture you made. That first drop of blood that you get, you'll use your gauze to wipe that drop of blood away. We do not want to use that first sample. All right, wipe it away and then milk the finger again to create a second drop. And then you'll bring your test strip to the blood. All right, you'll watch the blood filled the little test strip, and then it will begin to give you a read. You can see here, this is the little drop of blood letting you know that it's ready for a sample. All right, and then it will give you your read. Now, with diabetes, diabetes is a disturbance in the metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Now, this, uh, this is diabetes uh, mellitus. It is not like diabetes insipidus, which is actually a disease dealing with the kidneys. Uh, so just know there are different types of diabetes. Uh, you know, this one is specifically talking about carbohydrate issues. Now, within diabetes mellitus, you have uh, different subtypes in that. Type one, we see in, you know, patients who are generally onset at a younger age more lean, and that is their pancreas cannot 
secrete insulin. All right. Whereas type 2 diabetes, just we have insulin resistance. So you're over time, cells become, you know, desensitized to the insulin that gets secreted by the body. Maybe the pancreas isn't secreting insulin as effectively. Uh, and we have ultimately higher blood glucose levels. There are other subtypes like pre-diabetes and then gestational diabetes uh, that we can also see under diabetes mellitus. Now, with these patients, this patient will have a high blood glucose level. Uh, however, the cells of the body, with the exception of brain cells, okay, the cells of the body are not getting adequate levels of glucose. Now, the brain does not require insulin to use that glucose, so the brain's still getting what it needs. That excess level of glucose is getting excreted by the kidneys, causing water loss, leading to dehydration. Now, we start to see the kidneys uh, excrete glucose when blood sugar levels get about 185. Okay. However, it increases uh, substantially once sugar levels get, I believe, above 225. Is that's where we start to really see the patient urinating a lot more uh, and then losing a large amount of fluid when they urinate. Okay. Now we look for the three P's of diabetes. Now these are the big things to look for, and we see these relative to hyperglycemia. Okay, polydipsia, the patient's going to have excessive thirst. Okay, polyuria, they're going to be urinating excessively. And then polyphagia, the patient's going to have expressive, uh, excessive hunger. All right, so these are the three P's that we look for, and it's specific to hyperglycemic issues, so when sugar levels get high. Now, type 1 diabetes, pancreas does not secrete insulin. Okay, so therefore the patient then takes an injectable insulin to help them regulate their blood sugar levels. We see an onset here between the ages of 10 and 14, and these patients are more thin in nature. Type 1 diabetes uh, patients there are then prone to diabetic ketoacidosis. Now they're prone to diabetic ketoacidosis simply because their pancreas itself does not secrete uh, insulin therefore their body immediately turns to fats as an energy source and the breakdown of you know large levels of fats release ketones those ketones are naturally acidic which leads to your diabetic ketoacidosis now your type 2 diabetes these patients rely on oral medications diet and exercise to help manage their sugar levels now they could also rely on an injectable insulin but initially uh, you know early in a diagnosis we try to promote you know diet and exercise okay and then oral medications to help reduce or maintain sugar levels you know common oral medication like metformin Okay. Now, these patients are generally going to be middle-aged all right, and overweight. Now, we are seeing an earlier onset, uh, especially with your overweight or obese clients, just because they have a lot of peaks in sugar levels, uh, and then the body just becomes desensitized quicker. Now, type 2 diabetics are prone to hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome. Now, they're non-ketotic simply because their body still produces insulin, and there is some sensitivity to insulin, not nearly as much as it should be, but that prevents them from breaking down fat, you know, as an energy source first. They still have enough so you don't get that excess ketone production. Now, diabetics are prone to diseases and disorders of the blood vessels, such as heart attacks and strokes. All right, also kind of correlation there with uh, high sugar levels with diabetics is gonna be high cholesterol, and a lot of plaque buildup uh, in the vessels. Now also like large levels of sugar in the body, okay, trigger inflammatory responses, okay? So with these patients, they're gonna have a lot more plaque buildup in their blood vessels, you know, things like atherosclerosis, uh, which are putting them at risk for those heart attacks and strokes. Now, kidney failure, especially if their kidneys are having to uh, rely on filtering out glucose to high levels, but then also circulatory issues because of, you know, atherosclerosis and plaque buildup. Uh, now, infection, infection and poor healing. 
that is specific to the microcirculation, all right, where we're not adequately able to get blood to where it needs to go, like at the levels of the skin, especially on distal aspects of the body, down towards the feet. Uh, and these wounds happen, and then they don't heal, and they get larger and larger and turn like these diabetic ulcers, and they become gangrenous. And these patients are at high risk of losing extremities due to that poor circulation. Now, click on the action below that results from release of insulin. So think to yourself, what does insulin do? Well, we know now that insulin helps lower blood glucose levels by creating a channel for the cell to pull, okay? The cell can pull in sugar because insulin work does that key to open that door. So with this, A, glucose enters brain cells in larger quantities uh, that, required, uh, that are required for uh, cell metabolism. Okay, so we know that the brain does not need insulin to pull in sugar. Okay, so that's not it. Glycogen in the liver is broken down into glucose, increasing the blood glucose levels. Okay, no, uh, that would be more along the lines of glucagon. Glucagon is going to increase blood glucose levels. The rate at which glucose is taken up by the body cells increases. I like that one, all right, because that's what it does. It's the key that opens the door that increase the uptake of glucose into the cell and then the epinephrine levels are increased leading to tachycardia pale skin and sweating no insulin does not do that okay so our patient takes insulin because their sugar levels you know are 250 and they take an adequate dose and it lowers them down to the you know the 130 or wherever it is that they need to be, uh, they're not going to see a, an increased level of epinephrine from that insulin dose. It's when sugar levels get really low that we see epinephrine get released. Okay, so it's not going to be D. So your correct answer would be C there. Now, hypoglycemia. Now, usually occurs in type 1 diabetics, uh, mainly because they're more common to take injectable insulin. Okay. So maybe they took too much, maybe they took a dose and then didn't eat like they were supposed to. Maybe they took a dose, they ate, but then did a lot more work than what they're used to. Okay, so uh, with all the, with those factors, you know, it could lower their blood sugar, you know, dangerously low. Now, with hypoglycemia, you got to think about it like this. Patient takes insulin but does not eat a meal, sugar levels are going to drop. Okay, patient takes insulin, eats a meal, increases activity levels. Okay, sugar levels are going to drop. Patient takes too much insulin, sugar levels will drop. Okay, now can also occur in type 2 diabetics from the effects of oral medication, and it could be from the same causes. Okay, so that patient's taking an oral medicine. You know, let's just give you a scenario. Like you have a patient that is newly diagnosed with diabetes, they're overweight, uh, middle aged, and they're like, you know, I want to make a change in my life. You know, I want to make a change. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start eating right, you know, and they've been prescribed this medication, their body, they've been eating one way, you know, for years. All right. And I, they have this new diagnosis and they're like, I want to make a change. And they're like, I'm going to stop eating carbs and I'm going to, you know, go green and, you know, do all this good stuff. And they take their medication. So like, you know what, I'm going to go swimming today at the Y. And now that all of a sudden they don't eat like they normally eat. All right. Or maybe they don't eat at all. Or what they do, you know, I'm going to eat one egg white, you know, and then like, I'm going to go swim at the pool. And they go and swim and they're taking their medication. Their body's not used to that. OK, and that could lower blood sugar levels, you know, dangerously low. So these things can happen, especially in your newer, uh, newly diagnosed patients. Now, what we're looking for is going to be altered mental status. All right. Altered mental status is the, you know, the main sign and symptom that we're looking for with low blood sugar levels. Now, we also look for the signs and symptoms that relate to epinephrine release. Okay. So the cool, pale, clammy skin, okay, tachycardia, um, you know, shakiness or tremors. The patient may also say that they just, they feel like tired, lethargic. We're looking for things like slurred speech. All right. So those are some of the things that we're looking for with hypoglycemia. Okay. So here we go. So when we have a patient that uh, has you know, poor glucose levels in their body, the brain doesn't store glucose. So we start to see confusion, disorientation and drowsiness.
in severe cases, unresponsiveness, seizures, and stroke-like symptoms. Okay, so stroke-like symptoms, think, you know, facial droop, think arm drift, think slurred speech, your word salad, where they're jargling their words all up. Okay, now hypoglycemia unawareness. This is where over time, the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia change. And so when sugar levels get low, maybe they're used to, it's like, oh, I know my sugar levels are getting low because I'm getting a little shaky. I know my sugar levels are getting low because I feel like I'm getting tired and getting a headache, you know? And that's what they're used to. But sometimes, over time, those symptoms can change. And now they don't realize or recognize when their sugar levels get low. And then they have this acute onset altered mental status, and now they're to the point where they can do nothing about it. Now, we need to categorize our hypoglycemic patients in two ways, unresponsive, unable to swallow, or unable to follow commands, or altered mental status, but responsive, able to swallow, and able to follow commands. Now, we do this because that kind of branches our treatment. You know, unresponsive, unable to swallow, and unable to follow commands, we simply go on a BLS, maintain our ABCs, and get ALS and transport to the hospital. Whereas altered mental status, responsive, okay, able to swallow, able to follow commands. Now we go, you know, ABCs, of course, but then oral glucose to treat the patient. All right, so here we go. So unresponsive patients, like I said, maintain your ABCs. Keep that open airway. Uh, adequate oxygenation, so we'll supply supplemental oxygen if indicated. Okay, assess blood glucose levels, and then request ALS so they can give medications. They can give IV fluid with dextrose in it, okay, to increase blood sugar levels. Okay, because that patient's not going to be able to take oral glucose because you're going to cause an airway problem. Now, with altered mental status, able to swallow, able to follow commands, you know, maintain our ABCs, okay, assess their blood glucose level, and then administer a tube of oral glucose transbucally, so in between the cheek and the gum. Now, oral glucose, gel that's absorbed quickly, increasing blood glucose levels. Now, oral glucose can be administered if the following conditions are met. Altered mental status, history of diabetes controlled by medication or blood glucose level of less than 70. Uh, that's 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Uh, that's a typo, not millimeters of mercury. And then has the ability to swallow. That second bullet, though, I want you guys to pay attention to, except for the typo. Uh, and realize that you do not need a glucose level in order to give oral glucose. If they're altered, history of diabetes controlled by medicine, and they have the ability to swallow, you can give oral glucose, all right? You can give oral glucose because that medication that they take lowers sugar levels, all right? So let's, reason why this is, if you have a patient that's blood sugar levels is 40, all right, and they're altered and they're, you know, not doing well, and you give them oral glucose because they have the ability to swallow and you increase their sugar to 75, all right? They can return to a normal mentation. Okay, now all of a sudden they're alert and oriented times four. You can give them a sandwich that then increases their sugar levels farther. All right, and now they're they're fine. Whereas a patient that you know come to find out their sugar levels were 400, and you didn't know they were altered though. They had a history of diabetes controlled by medicine. They had an ability to swallow, and you gave that patient oral glucose. Well, you took that patient from 400 to 435. Okay it is not going to have that detrimental effect to the patient, okay? It's a, a risk, okay, the reward outweighs the risk at that point, all right? Because if those sugar levels are low, that patient can, you know, have brain cell death from being 35, 40 uh, versus, you know, and then you give them glucose and they recover uh, versus a patient who's, 400 and they go to 435, it's not going to have as significant an, an effect, okay? So just know you don't need a glucose level to give oral glucose. All right, here are the EMTs giving it transbucally in between the cheek and gum. Just know you don't want to just squirt it all in the back of their mouth because that can cause an airway problem. 
Okay, now intranasal glucagon. Now remember, glucagon is not actual glucose, okay? That's a hormone that gets secreted by the pancreas that we can give uh, intranasally, all right? And that will trigger the breakdown of glycogen, you know, that stored form of glucose in the liver, glycogen. Break that down and increase glucose levels in the blood. Now we need a mucosal atomizing device and a syringe to give it. And it may take 13 to 16 minutes in order to have the desired effect. Now, hyperglycemia. This is high blood glucose levels caused by relative lack of insulin. All right, so again, our diabetic patients, if they don't take medicine, a patient with diabetes is going to have high sugar levels. If not treated, they will have high sugar levels. All right, now extreme hyperglycemia may result in diabetic ketoacidosis, common in type 1, and then hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome, common in type 2. A lot of the signs and symptoms are similar, all right, with the exception of a couple, and we're going to talk about those. So, with diabetic ketoacidosis, okay, we see blood glucose levels typically greater than 350. Okay, without insulin to help move glucose into the cells, the cells are starved, and then the cell starts to burn fat for energy. Now this patient that has high sugar levels are getting this message like, man, I'm hungry, I need to eat something. All right, they're hungry, they need to eat something, so they're eating food. Now what does that do? That's raising their sugar levels more. All right, now their sugar levels are greater than 350, and so what else are they doing? Well, they're probably urinating a lot to let out the excessive blood sugar, right? And so with that excessive urination, the water's following it, they're going to be thirsty. So they're going to be drinking a lot. So they're going to have those three Ps, polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. All right, so those are some of the things that you're going to see with that patient. Now, uh, factors that can lead to DKA include infection, inadequate insulin dose, okay, so they're not taking adequate amount. All right, certain medications, physical stress, surgery, trauma, all right, why? Because that increases uh, the body's stress response, increases stress hormones such as epinephrine and cortisol, which decrease the efficacy of insulin that the patient does take, and then increase carbohydrate intake. All right, now, our signs and symptoms produced primarily by dehydration and acid buildup. Now, we talked about those a little bit, uh, but some of the other big signs and symptoms that you'll see, and this related to the acid buildup, is going to be Kussmaul respirations. Okay, Kussmaul respirations are respirations that uh, are deep and fast. Okay, so the patient's going to be breathing deep and fast, and they're doing that to blow off that excess CO2 that they have. All right, so the body is trying to work as a buffer system to let out that acidosis that they're dealing with. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis progresses slowly over a few days. All right, now another thing that they're going to have is a fruity smell on their breath, all right, which you're not going to see in hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non ketotic syndrome. All right, now. With your uh, dehydration effects, uh, things that you can look for are going to be poor skin trigger. So you like pinch the skin and it stays tinted. Uh, you know, tachycardia we've talked about already. Uh, but also a positive tilt test. Now think back, like orthostatic vital signs. So you have their, them laying supine. You take a blood pressure and you take a pulse. All right. Then you know, after two minutes, you stand them up and you take a blood pressure and you take a pulse again. If their heart rate's increased by more than 10 to 20 beats per minute and their systolic blood pressure has decreased more than 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury, that is a positive tilt test, which indicates they're, they're dehydrated. There's fluid loss. All right. Other things you should look for is nausea, vomiting, and muscle cramps, mainly due to electrolyte abnormalities from their dehydration. All right, so those are all things to look for with your DKA patient. Now, our medical care for this patient is going to be to maintain your ABCs. All right, check their sugar levels. Here we go. If you're not un, if you're not sure, okay, administer oral glucose, okay, if they can swallow, okay, and then contact medical direction if you have any questions. Big treatment for this patient is going to be at the hospital, and it's going to be insulin. Okay, that is what that patient needs. All right, now, 
hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome. So blood glucose levels are high, 600 to 1,200 milligrams per deciliter. Now we start to see our body let out glucose to the urine. Okay, That pulls a lot of water with it, which leads to significant dehydration. Now, with HHNS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome, okay, this patient, remember, this is more prevalent in our type 2 diabetics, there is still insulin there. That insulin does still have some effect for, to pull glucose into the cell, just not as effective, all right? Therefore, we don't have that ketone production from the fat breakdown, all right? So we don't have ketones. We don't have ketones, therefore we don't have the acidosis, okay? We don't have the acidosis, therefore we don't have the Kussmaul respirations, okay? We don't have that fat breakdown and ketone productions, large levels of like, um, the acid buildups. We also don't have the, the fruity smell on the breath, all right? This does carry a high mortality rate, okay? And your care is mainly going to be supportive of ABCs, transporting the patient. Now, our signs and symptoms, similar to that of DKA, okay, no significant buildup of ketones in the body, therefore no significant acid load, no Kussmaul respirations or fruity odor on the breath with HHS, okay? So that's kind of your, your big, you know, kind of those big signs and symptoms that will differentiate the two, all right? You're, you'll still have your three Ps. The patient may still be tachycardic. The patient may still have you know, low blood pressure. You may still have positive tilt test, all that stuff. You just won't have Kussmaul respirations or fruity odor on the breath. Again, supportive care. ABCs, transport, definitive care for this patient is going to be receiving insulin in the hospital. All right. There you go, check blood glucose levels. Again, if you're unsure, they're say they're altered. History of diabetes controlled by medicine, they got the ability to swallow. If you're not sure, you can give oral glucose. Then contact medical direction if you have any questions. And this table kind of shows you some of the uh, signs and symptoms of the different diabetic emergencies, DKA, HHNS, and uh, hypoglycemia. Now, some of the ones that I really want to point out to you here is going to be your onset, okay? And I'm pointing out onset because, uh, it, guys, like, this is one thing that you guys can do to have a very positive outcome with the patient, all right? If this is an acute onset, all right, that should be definitely pointing you in the direction of a hypoglycemic emergency, all right, where you can give oral glucose. Now, the other two, of course, you can give oral glucose, all right, but understand that this is going to be a more gradual onset over the period of a couple days, all right. So, if you have a patient with history of diabetes controlled by medicine, the sudden onset of altered mental status, all right, that is a good indicator that this patient is suffering from a hypoglycemic emergency. And remember, oral glucose, if we give it to a patient, you know, if they met that criteria where it's high, the odds of us doing harm to that patient are very low compared to the positive outcome that it would have if the patient's sugar levels were low and we bring it up just a little bit, okay? Now, let's break down some of your emergency care. Notice with DKA and HHNS, it's mainly supportive, supporting ABCs, all right? And then hypoglycemia, it's supportive and oral glucose. Again, note your definitive care for DKA and HHNS is going to be insulin, okay, which is going to be given at the hospital. Now, that concludes uh, this period of instruction. Okay, we've talked about uh, we've talked about diabetes and the regulation of blood glucose levels in the body. Okay, we've talked about you know the def definition of hypoglycemia. Okay, and some of the signs and symptoms that you see with hypoglycemia. We talked about your indications for oral glucose and that it's indicated for hypoglycemic patients. Now we've talked about hyperglycemic problems. Okay, such as DKA and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome. Big takeaway, guys, understand type 1 diabetics, prone to DKA, Kussmaul respirations, okay, that fruity smell on the breath, all right, common DKA, 
Type 2 diabetics are prone to HHNS. We see similar signs and symptoms to DKA, but we do not see Kuzmal respirations and we don't have the, the fruity smell on the breath. All right, that concludes this class and thank you for your time.